going to be recording the session today. So just want to let you know that we are going to be recording and then we will be sharing that with Jesse as well as putting it on our website. But now I am going to um, introduce Bruce Janda, let him um, introduce Jesse and get us started on tasting wine and talking about the wines. Thanks, Mary. We want to, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. Um, yes, we want to welcome back Jesse to AWS Denver. And I say back because believe it or not, and maybe Jeff and Schultz would probably be the only ones in this crowd that would remember when Jesse was here 14 years ago as of last month. So I, uh, I do want to welcome Jesse back. We're, like Mary said, he's been great to work with. And I don't care what he says, the dude doesn't look any different than he did 14 years ago. Would you agree with that, Schultz and, Schultz and Jeff? That's hair. That's hair. <laughs> you didn't have that much then either, but, uh, you know, you still, still look like a young guy. Um, so Jesse's got a great story about his winery and about his family, and he's very knowledgeable about the Willamette Valley. And we're kind of going to just let him speak um, to that and probably get started with, um, uh, with, the, with the history of the winery. And we'll kind of let you go through that. And then we're going to talk about other things like um, soil types and terroir and AVAs and all kinds of fun stuff. So with that, Jess, Jesse, go ahead. It's not late for dinner, that's all. Um, well, first of all, thank you everybody um, for uh, taking the time to be with, with, with us virtually here. Um, it's really an honor. Uh, and certainly Mary and Bruce have just been so wonderful to work with uh, to put this together. So kudos to them. Um, I have a favorite saying about wine that wine's highest purpose is to bring good people together, um, probably around food or without, but it's really, uh, it's just fantastic to be here with y'all. And these are really trying times for everybody. Um, I don't think anybody's impervious to the stress that all this uncertainty causes, but I've really been emboldened um, and felt really uplifted by the time that I've been able to share with people and be able to host you virtually from our state winery and vineyard here, uh, smack dab in the Dundee Hills of, of the Willamette Valley. So first off, thank you guys for, for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for opening the wines. Um, it's, it's really a communal experience for me that is really positive and I, I hope you guys feel the same and you can, we'll have a poll question on that later. <laughs> so you can lay it on that, but thanks for taking the time and certainly for Bruce and Mary for allowing me the opportunity to, to interact with you guys. So um, I'm Jesse Lang. I'm second generation wine grower and winemaker for my family's uh, 33 year old uh, Dundee Hills property. As like I mentioned right here in the Willamette Valley. Um, instead of giving you guys a hosting program from my cellar, which is, you know, we've all seen a lot of barrels. You guys, I'm sure, too, are a lot of sellers. I figured it'd be fun just to post up here in the middle of my Red Side Vineyard, uh, which is one of our three estate properties here in the Dundee Hills, and run a bunch of extension cords and set up a couple things. It's my daughter's tractor out there, so uh, it's not our real one that we use, but it's a John Deere. And uh, so post up right here in the middle of our estate vineyard. Um, giving you guys a shout from um, this property is about 350 foot elevation, but it's right in the middle of the Dundee Hills. So we're east facing kind of that Cote d'Or uh, aspect towards uh, the Cascade Range directly to the east. And then behind me is the Coast Range. So the Willamette Valley is kind of that bread basket that's uh, in the western part of the state of Oregon. And we're definitely in that, what I call that first concentric circle of the Willamette Valley and, and of wine growing here uh, in the Willamette, which uh, a good friend of mine who's no longer with us, David Lett, started his wife, Diana, and his son, Jason Lett, from the Irie Vineyards in 1965, and the first to plant pro post-prohibition Pinot Noir and Vinifera here in the Willamette Valley. So I'm really a, uh, a liaison um, and kind of a byproduct of, uh, of, of their fortitude to plant Pinot Noir here in the Willamette Valley, and certainly my parents that moved here in 1987. Um, to stake our claim and uh, to start Lang Estate Winery um, in our basement back uh, before there was even an industry called the Willamette Valley Wine Industry. And sometimes I say like, um, my folks didn't, Don and Wendy, they didn't just start a brand. We literally created a category called Willamette Valley Wine. And even as a young man, I can remember growing up and, you know, people would be, you, you'd, you'd travel anywhere or, or you'd present wines and they'd be like, you're going Pinot Noir in Oregon? And uh, to see that paradigm shift from where we were 
in the late 80s uh, all the way to 2020, where you can't go into any self-respecting, fantastic restaurant on the globe, and they don't have a Lamb Valley category for Pinot Noir. It's really an incredible paradigm shift, and I've been fortunate to to be a uh, um, to have sort of a unique perspective on that evolution. Being here, and we planted the vineyards when I was 10 years old, and so I, I've literally grown up in the Lamb Valley wine industry, and it's just been a, a fantastic uh, ride to be able to see our our evolution where we've come in relatively in wine terms fairly fairly fast so um, I know you guys are all familiar with Lamb Valley wines you're all wine professionals and wine aficionados obviously so hopefully everybody has some wine not if you have some wine so I know you're not here just to hear me here just to hear me talk so please go back and forth through the wines um, I attend a lot of different wine seminars uh, to keep my continuing education I do a lot of uh, presenting at wine tastings and nothing annoys me more than you hear somebody drone on and on and on about wines and you have 10 wines in front of you and you're like, can I please just taste the wines a little bit? Because it's really about your experience with the wines, not what I'm telling you. So feel free to bop back and tweet between them. You don't have to, uh, there's no specific order per se, although we'll lead you through the wines in that order that Mary and Bruce mentioned, but really it's about interactivity um, having some discourse with you, answering any questions. Uh, if there's any opportunity to, you know, throw my neighbors under the bus or answer any questions about them, I'm happy to. So it's really, uh, it's really fun. So we'll keep it interactive and um, pretty, uh, pretty relaxed. So um, in terms of uh, my estate, so my history, I told you my folks moved here in 87 with the dream to plant, a uh, little cloud going overhead there, uh, Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, um, before there was really that that reputation so it, it took a lot of fortitude it took a lot of risk to be able to be here um, we had the taste room in our house for uh, 10 years so literally if you came to Lang Estate you were tasting in our basement from 1987 to 1997 uh, we just built a new 4,000 square foot tasting room which you guys are welcome to come I think we're opening on on June 1st, still pending, but that's the plan. So when you be able to come, you'll, you'll see it's not in the basement anymore, so I don't wanna scare you, but I just wanna tell you a little bit about that evolution. So, uh, so that's just up the hill. So the production facility is at 750 foot elevation. Um, we have 45 acres up there at the top of the hill that we farm as well. Um, but this site is our lowest elevation property. So I was gonna show you guys, since we're in the vineyard, I was gonna show you a little bit about the growth that we've had. Um, this spring, about three weeks ago, um, this is about the kind of growth that we had out there in the vineyard. So pretty small, about uh, five or six, four or five inches here. And then um, I took this from today. So this is uh, a vine that's actually preformed clusters. I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of vineyards, but maybe you've not seen a lot of vineyards at this stage. So these are clusters, this is pre-bloom. So we're in a, um, in a period in, the growth cycle where this is flowering. So these grapes are about to flower and self-pollinate. And then we'll have all these little beautiful, hopefully 90 gram clusters, 120 gram clusters of Pinot Noir floating all over the place. So little hand grenades of purple Pinot Noir. Um, so that's kind of the next stage here in the vineyard. Um, this site here is all on volcanic soils, which is one of the, the key components of Willamette Valley wines. Um, I got some soil here for you guys. So this is actually one of the, the four soil types that was on our quiz earlier. So this is a uh, fractionated and oxidizing basalt. Uh, it's about 25 to 50 million years old. And uh, it's very red in nature um, and kind of gives the red hills of Dundee their character. So this is the predominant soil here in the Dundee Hills, although there are a number of different soils, hillside soils here in the Lamont Valley that inform and we make different wines from. Uh, but this is a very compelling soil. Also happens to be Oregon State soil, which is a subtype called Jory. So it's great to grow on. It, uh, it sort of, uh, it drains really well, um, but it's not super mineral rich. So the vines have to go deep to find the nutrients that we want. We're non-irrigated here. So we definitely encourage the vines and the root systems to go low, extract a lot of the minerals um, and kind of write out those uh, variances in the growing season. So the soil type here is a key component. We're gonna talk about this soil type when we taste that estate Pinot Noir. So I want you guys to think about that when you think about any sort of Dundee Hills appellated wine that you have from the Willamette Valley is really informed a lot by this soil type. Um, for me, that 
Pinot Noir algorithm and expression is, is a very long multi-inputted one, but uh, soil type is sort of an outsized component. And one of my favorite parts about it is that outside of like clone or farming techniques or rootstock um, or you know uh, average inches of rain per year precipitation, soil type is one you can actually reach out and touch. You can feel it, it's super tactile. You can see it gets your socks and hands all dirty. But um, it's for me a really key component uh, in the expression of Pinot Noir. So when I farm these soil types, I oversee all the farming and viticulture on our 45 acres. Um, these sites here ten, tend to produce grapes that have nice, really beautiful red fruit, great minerality, but they tend to ripen slowly um, and tend to build complexity in really compelling ways. So this soil type kind of defines our estate lines. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, I got dirt all over my table here. So um, Pinot Gris, you guys want to talk about Pinot Gris? This is kind of the first one. All right. Uh, so. I grabbed all the bottles. One good thing about doing tastings like this, I could take all the wine I want from the taste room. <laughs> so uh, this is our Pinot Gris um, Reserve 2018. So this is a wine uh, and a varietal that Oregonians should be very proud of. Uh, we're not very good at tooting our own horn because we don't really have marketing departments. But Pinot Gris is a varietal that started here in the Willamette Valley in terms of the new world. So the first 12 producers um, of this varietal here in all of North America we're here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, my family was the fourth producer of Pinot Gris in all of the United States back in 1987, and the very first to make a style of Pinot Gris that was more Alsatian. So this wine here is fermented in what I call uh, neutral French oak barrels, but they're 500 liter barrels. So they're 130 gallons. They're really big barrels, over, almost over twice the size of the typical barrels that you and I think of for our standard barriques. Um, but these are very neutral. Some of these barrels are over 20 years old. So very old Pinot Gris vines. Um, some of it's from some of the oldest vines uh, planted in the early 80s and late 70s in Yamhill Carlton District. Some of it's off of our estate and some of it's off down the hill here in the Dundee Hills from a site called Tuckwila. So our Pinot Gris tends to be a little bit more, especially this, this style here, tends to be a little bit more Alsatian. Um, sees a little bit of that, that fermentation on the leaves, so that, that um, sediment that will precipitate out of solution, fall to the bottom of the barrel. Um, and that slow oxidation through the staves really combines to make a wine that's very engaging, a little bit richer on the palate, um, and very complex. So you guys think about a bottling like this, it's very similar to a lot of our other bottlings in that this wine is the amalgamation um, and the selection of probably 40 different wines. So we treat every single block that we make, be it Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, or Pinot Noir, every single block that we farm and that we craft, we farm and craft separately. So literally we have maybe 40 different vessels be between our, our French oak punchins that we'll select with different vineyard sites, different clones of Pinot Gris, um, different yeast selections for the fermentation. So they have all, all these different components that they can bring to the table. And then we literally take about five or six months to select the best wines to craft the reserve Pinot Gris. So for us, we hope that this wine is one of the better varietals, uh, better examples of the varietal here domestically. And I think it holds its own um, for Pinot Gris across the US and um, just in terms of its complexity um, and its specificity of, of Pinot Gris expression. So Jesse, the first time I tasted this wine was with the Chicago tasting last month. and. I mean, I just, you're right, it screamed Alsatian Pinot Gris and Alsace wines are some of my favorite wines. And, and so I agree with you that it does have the complexity of Alsatian wines and really enjoy this wine, really enjoy this wine. One question that came up in the chat box is that um, there's a lot, it appears to be a lot of grass in the, in, throughout the vineyard. Does that help you with the water and the soil? Yeah, all the grass. Actually, uh, my tractor broke uh, two days ago. <laughs> so, um, we've had great conditions for growth. Unfortunately, well, as a byproduct of having great growth conditions, your vineyards, uh, the weeds grow just as fast as the plants. So <laughs> I'm a little behind. Um, there's a belt that I got to buy that's specific to this particular mower. So that PTO is not working perfectly. But uh, I don't always wear a collared shirt, by the way. Uh, so yeah, our, our tractor's a little malfunctioning right now. But we are planning on mowing tomorrow. So um, but this is a great observation. I mean, like for us, I don't want our vineyards to look like a Japanese garden, to be honest with you. I want our, our vineyards to look vibrant. 
Um, I want them to be in balance between um, and everybody. Raise your hand if you guys have heard that term, like uh, you want your vines to be stressed. Everybody's heard that. You know, you want to stress your vines. You want to stress them. It's like I grew up hearing these terms, and it's just for me, it's slightly annoying because, you know, what organism do you know that really thrives when it's completely stressed out? I know of no organism, be it, be it a plant or human being or any sort of fauna I, or, or flora. Like, I just don't understand that. For me, you want your vines to be challenged. So vine balance is something that's really critical when I look at managing our vineyard sites. So we actually monitor cover crops uh, separately. We have a no-till, half-till, and, and maybe full-till policy, depending on the block. So I mix up my viticultural techniques uh, depending on the specific block. So this property here is 10 acres of Pinot Noir. This is uh, planted in 2007. This is Pomard clone on uh, 10114 rootstock here. And I actually farm this block differently than I do my triple seven, which is right down the hill. There's a little bit more, it's uh, heavier soils down there. So I actually do no till down there. And typically I'll do like half till up here. So it depends on every specific block. And that's sort of the micro farming that we do that really informs the micro winemaking side. Um, and our sites are all, um, you guys probably hear a lot, we could do a whole seminar on um, what I call responsible viticulture, that, that big, uh, big umbrella. And under that you hear about biodynamics as a silo, organics as a silo, and then sustainability as a silo. So there's kind of those three things. I spend a lot of time listening to people uh, parse them very thin and, and argue and bicker between them. I'm way over that. I think it's just important that we, that we farm and we take agriculture in a positive direction for our planet. And we farm in one of those three, three components. So for us, we're sustainably certified under the LIVE program, which is an acronym for Low Input Viticulture and Enology, um, which is, I, I, hate, I don't like the paperwork because it's a huge, huge, like complete and utter maddening Excel spreadsheet to fill out and follow. But we really, we really like being a part of the program and it's been great across the country. I think there's over uh, 2,000, 2,500 vineyards that are part of the program. So um, our vineyards are sustainably certified. Um, we're organically sprayed, but um, it's not, um, uh, I, I don't really uh, choose to like get into the whole uh, philosophy bickering about, oh, are you biodynamic? Um, we don't run around and naked in the vineyard planting cow horns and, and, and full moons, but um, uh, we, we do, we do uh, employ a lot of sustainable practices here on the property. So we were talking about Pinot Gris, right? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of the, the weeds behind me, we are going to mow and we do, we do a lot of tilling uh, depending on the block. So it fluctuates, but this block here, um, it is, the grass is a little high, but uh, some of that's on purpose. We want to encourage a lot of beneficials. So a lot of different insects uh, and promote the beneficial insects that um, like bees and honeybees. Uh, we have a lot of different butterflies here. And one of those checklists for the live program is this, uh, what kind of beneficials that you have in both the flora and the fauna in particular been here. So Jesse, can you speak a little bit to um, the different AVAs and the different soil types within those and, and the significance of that and, and how that affects uh, your, your operation? Yeah, that's a fascinating part. Um, you know, growing up here, we basically had one AVA, which was the Willamette Valley, which is a huge ge geographical region. So starts in Portland, goes all the way down to just uh, almost north of Corvallis, south of Corvallis a little bit, almost Eugene, where the Ducks play. Uh, my second favorite team in Oregon. Uh, I'm a beaver, if you can't tell. Uh, so it's almost 200 miles long, 50 miles wide. It's kind of a big rectangle with a lot of variation on the edges. But that's a huge geographical region. In 2000, we, uh, we worked, uh, a number of us got together as some of the pioneers, and we decided to not only submit our application to the, the ATF, the ATF um, to go through the process of, of creating micro appellations within the Willamette Valley. We felt it was kind of past time. Uh, anytime you draw any lines, that could be a very difficult thing for some people. Uh, it, it wasn't without contention, but we really felt that these different little pockets expressed Pinot Noir in a way, and, and Chardonnay and Pinot Gris in a way that was different than their, their neighboring ABA. So one of the things I'm proud of is the Willamette Valley came together. We submitted all six sub-appellations of the Willamette Valley at one time. So total show of force, 
total show of, of the community that I'm involved with um, in a way that we, we made it a commitment on behalf of the Willamette Valley and of Oregonians. So that was pretty cool. And those six AVAs are Dundee Hills, the uh, Yamhill Carlton AVA, the Shehala Mountains, Ribbon Ridge, Eola Amity, and McMinnville AVA. So those are the original six. Now do you have the Van Duzer AVA, which is south of here. We have the Mount Pisgah AVA. So as you guys are wine professionals, you know, you could get really microscopic um, about terroir. It could be a little crazy. Uh, thank God we're not quite like Burgundy yet, but uh, those things, they allow for expression. And, and, and it's, a real, it's a real thing with Pinot Noir. I mean, I work with a varietal that it's really hard to grow. It's really hard to make, but I think it has at its best in a singular ability to showcase terroir and showcase site is a red varietal. So uh, for me, we make all these different Pinot Noirs, 400 different Pinot Noir barrels every year. Um, and we can trace them back to the exact soil type and plot of land. So for us, it's, it's the part that keeps us motivated um, and is really compelling for growing great wines. But those AVAs have very clear, distinctive characters. Um, like one of the ones like Shehala Mountains there is really defined, um, I'm pointing like you guys can see, but just a little bit to the north and east of here is the mountains. And those soil types on those north facing slopes are almost all lowest soils or the less soils. Those are windblown, siltier soils. And I think they produce wine that have a lot of like blue fruit and kind of round, really voluptuous tannins. And if you guys know our friends, um, my colleagues, uh, Louisa and Maria Ponzi, who own the Ponzi Winery, um, two just rock star gals making great wine and running the winery there. Uh, Ponzi, they're some of the, the pioneers that actually came before us almost all their estate vineyards are on those lowest soils. So if you have one of their wines, that's a great example of that soil type. Um, another site that's south of here in the Yola Amity Hills uh, has both volcanic and marine sedimentary soils. And those soil types play into it a lot. So a couple of the, the AVAs are kind of defined by their soil type, one being the Dundee Hills, but not it's not a one size fits all in terms of the soil type, but there are definitely, definitely um, components that arise that are unique and are characteristic from those different AVAs. So they're very fun to work with. I've made wine and Pinot Noir from every single one of those AVAs and um, it, it doesn't get less fascinating. It's, it's a lot more fun than writing back labels. <laughs> What do you have to say about the Chardonnay, Jesse? Yeah, um, Chardonnay. Does you want everybody want to move on to Chardonnay? Okay. Sorry if I can talk too much. I get a little no, nervous. Right. Um, so Chardonnay. So this is probably uh, I mentioned like the 33-year-old overnight success for the Willamette Valley. Uh, we've been making great Chardonnay. Um, I think especially in the last 10 years, a lot of the Dijon clones that our friend David Adelstein brought in through Oregon State University in the early 90s. Uh, those Dijon clones have really give us more clonal material here in the Willamette Valley. And I, I'm obviously very bullish about our brand and about our wines, but I, I truly believe that we're making some of the best examples of Chardonnay in the entire world now. Um, I'm not sure I felt that way 20, 30 years ago, um, but I think we've definitely arrived in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, so our style is a little different than maybe kind of that, what I call kind of Southern Pacific Coast style, that kind of California style of Chardonnay where, and I made those wines. I worked at Santa Barbara Winery for two years. I did botanage on barrels. I, I did a lot of barrel procurement. Um, so I made those, those wines, uh, helped make those wines. So I have a good feel for it. Uh, our style kind of has a foot uh, sort of old world stylistically, but new world fruit. And those Dijon codes really create the, the platform for more clonal diversity, I think have allowed for those expressions. So um, this wine, particular wine here is our reserved tier Chardonnay, and it's a selection of barrels from our three oldest vineyard sites for Chardonnay. So 100% Dijon clone from Freedom Hill, from Lang Estate right here, and then from my friend Paul Durant and Durant Vineyards, uh, just Dundee Hills as well, but just a couple miles uh, to the west. Um, they're, all those blocks are farmed separately, they're fermented separately. So this 2018 is kind of fun because this is the first time I employed um, and Chardonnay in our, our uh, neutral kind of our, our concrete egg. So we have a lot of different barrels, 60 gallon barrels, 130 gallon barrels, anywhere from 10 years old to brand new. And then that egg component and then stainless steel. So this is an amalgamation of select reserve components from each of those fermentation vessels. So like I said, we'll keep them all separate and then only blend when we feel like we have the best wine um, with a lot of trialing that we get to do in the cellars. A lot of, lot of, a lot of tasting, 
um, a lot of bench trials that we put together to try to select for the best uh, best expression of those wines. And the Three Hills Cuvée is just, um, uh, it's been a rock star wine for us. Um, I mentioned to Bruce and Mary earlier, we actually bottled the 2019 just last week. Uh, so I'm familiar with that vintage. Um, and this is uh, rounding out the last bit of our 2018 vintage. So um, smoking good vintage across the board and um, really excited to see the, the way Chardonnay is starting to take off in the Willamette Valley. I know um, the, the plantings of Chardonnay have gone from strength to strength and you're seeing more and more and you're going to be hearing more and more and more about Willamette Valley Chardonnay. Jesse, just a real quick question on production. So I think the Chardonnay is incredibly well balanced. Um, I don't get that shot of acid up front that I get often with some some wines. Could could you tell me, um, I'm just gonna ask you, are you guys acidifying? No, so that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, a philosophy that we employ here and I grew up with was, if you grow your grapes in the right place, you farm them appropriately and you pick them on time, you shouldn't have to make a lot of adulteration techniques and inputs in the winery. No acid added, even for a warm year like 2018, um, something we're very proud of. Uh, we definitely pick with an eye towards acid. You know, I, I look, people ask, well, what bricks did you pick out? It's like, ah, you no know, bricks. Like I, I pick at uh, glucose fructose level, so I don't pick at bricks necessarily. But like I look at a triangle, right? So, you know, your sugar levels is one point. Your TA is another point, your titratable acidity, your overall acid, and then your pH is another. Within that triangulation is flavor components. We always pick on flavor, um, but those, that data that we, that we take definitely helps inform us, but we sample all those grapes. So when I talk about micro farming, um, there's like a hundred different blocks of grapes that we select every year, that we farm and that we pick. So if you guys come to the cellar uh, pre-harvest before we picked any grape, it looks like we just have flights and flights of, of stem, stem set up all over the place with just grape juice. So one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is I sample. Um, I'm very specific about it. I'm very hard headed about it. I have a, a methodology that I employ for the same. So it's repeatable. And I go through and sample every block that we pick. So oftentimes I'm just driving around the valley, taking one gallon Ziploc bags and taking samples from every one of those blocks. We track that trajectory of ripeness. So we run the bricks or the fermentable sugars, we run the TA, we run the pH, and we look for flavor, but only we pick on flavor. So when it comes to Chardonnay, you know, we're picking this at lower sugar levels, maybe 22, maybe 21 and a half bricks, um, somewhere in there. Um, but the pHs are right around like 3.15, 3.2, which I think if you're gonna pick one number, pH is probably the best one to pick and select for, for physiological ripeness. And, and we're looking to, to make sure that we create and sort of capture that vibrancy in the wine. Because you know, Chardonnay is a varietal, and white wines in general don't have that much tannin backbone. So really their frame is all predicated on their acid balance. And for me, that's the most compelling thing about Chardonnay. It just, it has such a je ne sais quoi of, of, of acid balance and vibrancy on the palate. Like just can be racy and, and, and bright, but it always, great wines like Chardonnay can make you come back for another sip. And it's that tension in the wine that I, I try to retain um, naturally from the grapes. So I know you have a few questions about food pairings um, with some of your wines. So I'd like, can you speak to um, good food pairings for this Chardonnay? And then as we get to the Pinots, perhaps you can um, offer some su suggestions along those lines too. Yeah, it's great. I mean, we, I mean, <laughs> my dad's always drinking, sipping Pinot Noir in the mornings. Uh, and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, Pinot Noir is food, damn it. I'm like, <laughs> I get that. So yeah, the, the pairing of food with wine is, is really critical. I mean, really, you know, you can have great wine, you can have great food. You pair them together and you can maybe attain a level of, of experience that's even better than they could be on their own. So certainly that's a, a philosophy for our farming. It's a philosophy for our, our winemaking, our picking decisions, and making wines with good acids so they do pair well with food uh, and good balance. So um, in terms of like specific uh, pairings, uh, you know, I think the wines, like I don't hold a lot of, uh, I, I'm not gonna give like a, a specific like preparation or whatnot, because I just think that's a little uh, uh, ostentatious. <laughs> probably are, are presumptuous maybe to say, oh, you need to have this wine with like a specific dish. But um, I, I kind of like to experiment and I always say food and mood dictate what I want to drink. So like, what kind of mood are you in? 
What kind of food are you pairing with it? What are you thinking about? How does that all come together? It's, it's kind of a specific, you know, personal decision. Uh, in general, our Chardonnays pair really well with chicken, great with fish. Um, they got that great acidity towards the end. So I think they pair well with a lot of different cuisines. It gives them that, um, I think that spectrum um, to pair really well. And then, you know, Pinot Noir is just, I don't know a chef that doesn't love Pinot Noir. So, um, you know, those are the people I like to surround myself with. <laughs> But I also wanted to remind everybody that not only are you the winemaker, but you're also the general manager of the operation, right? Yeah, so I oversee, um, you know, winemaker, um, vineyard manager, and GM, or whatever the hell that means. But, yeah, sometimes you run out of toilet paper, they call me too. And, um, <laughs> yeah, you do, it, you do it all. I mean, we're a small craft winery. You produce, you know, fifteen to 20,000 cases a year. So, certainly it's more than we made in 87 in our basement. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a hands-on operation to be sure. And, you know, we really look to craft still at the, you know, the, the single barrel level, 230 liters or 60 gallons. That's, that's what we look to do because I don't want to grow to a point where I don't know every barrel in the cellar. And how did your parents decide to come up to Willamette Valley to do this? What, what drove that decision? Yeah, um, I think, <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to think of myself as a, as a pretty, you know, like, I don't want to say accomplished, but experienced winemaker. But I don't know if I'd have the the sort of courage it took to come to the Willamette Valley and stake a claim here. Um, that's that's something I don't know if I'd have that in me to do. Um, so I'm always really just amazed when I think about what my folks Don and Wendy went through to um, to plant our flag here. And they had had some wines. They were working in the Santa Barbara wine industry. My dad was assistant winemaker under Bruce McGuire at Santa Barbara Winery, um, which I had worked in a lot later. But uh, uh, they'd had a number of wines uh, down there. They, they got into wine. It sort of became a passion for them. And uh, my dad was teaching at UC Santa Barbara. Um, my mom, Wendy, was doing a lot of ballet classes and teaching. And, you know, they really decided to, they started making wine at home, um, in addition to being the assistant winemaker there at Santa Barbara Winery. And they kind of felt like Pinot Noir was the varietal that they wanted to, to track and the varietal that, that sort of, I don't know, uh, it, it was the most enthusiastic for them. And then they had a number of different wines from the Willamette Valley, some of those early uh, 80s wines from David Lett, uh, and then our buddy Dick Erath. So uh, a couple of Soka Blosser wines, a couple of wines from Ponzi. So they came up here a couple of times, did a number of, of exploratory uh, visits. And then literally we, they, they bought our first 40 acres and threw uh, everything in a U-Haul truck and, and they moved and it was crazy. It's, to this day, it just seems like it's almost a fairy tale, you know? But, uh, but in, in to take that kind of risk because they felt in the bottle, the wines had the quality and there wasn't, you know, a lot of specific viticulture like we're employing today. You know, wine really wasn't in a full-blown industry. You know, sometimes we talk about the industrial wine complex. That didn't really exist back then. And so things have changed. But um, really in Vino Veritas, I think for them, they tasted the wines and they felt like this is going to be the best place in, in uh, the new world to plant Pinot Noir. Well, should we move on to some keynotes? What's up, Bruce? Can we move on to some Pinot Noirs? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'll give you guys kind of a background on Pinot Noir. Um, I hope everybody liked the white wines, but yes. everybody's here for probably Pinot Noir too, of course, being our, uh, our kind of flagship varietal here in the Willamette Valley. Um, I get to craft about 12 to 15 bottlings of Pinot Noir every year. So we're going to try three of those through two different vintages, really fun, compelling stuff to do. Uh, but keep in mind, I make a lot more different wines for our wine club. Um, and for like specific blocks of Pinot Noir, single vineyard stuff. So, um, you know, like I said, mentioned earlier, we have four to 500 different barrels of Pinot Noir in the cellar. You can track every single one of those barrels back to the plot of land that it came from. So we are literally obsessed about terroir expression. And for me, it kind of creates that feedback loop between vineyard to wine, from wine to vineyard. So we learn and we use what we understand about a particular vineyard site. And we use that for our winemaking. We understand, when we understand the wines in the cellar, we use that to help our farming for the following year and years. So for kind of creates that loop for us. So the three wines that we have here are very different. I hope they, they showcase really well. The Reserve Pinot Noir is the first one we're gonna try and that's, or hopefully you've been drinking it the whole time I've been talking. But the Reserve Pinot Noir is our 2017 Reserve. So this is a bottling 
probably the funnest Pinot Noir, um, the funnest Pinot Noir we get to make every year. Um, and I say that sort of tongue in cheek and that I don't have any self-imposed rules about which blocks and which vineyards or clones, um, age of vine we can select to, to, to craft this particular bottling. Um, so for me, it's a great snapshot of the vintage 2017 and a reserve bottling from the vintage from the North Willamette Valley. Most of this wine comes from our estate and from Freedom Hill at a clip of like 70%. And then 30% are from Durant Vineyards, Mistletoe Vineyards, our Yamhill, uh, Yamhill Carlton properties, just a little bit to the West. So it's a really good, um, I think sort of captures that essence of the, of the vintage and of this particular blend. So uh, for me, it tends to play a little bit more in the red fruit spectrum. So it has a lot of red fruit components. It's kind of flashy. I love this sort of like polished ruby aspect of it. I think it just, it's a very um, it, it sort of evocative wine and beautifully balanced too. It's I also tongue in cheek call it my house pour Pinot because I basically have a box downstairs all the time that I can crack and pour all the time. So uh, for us, I hope, I'd love to hear your comments about it, but for me, it's a really compelling wine to make and pretty much a selection of maybe some of the top 100 barrels in our cellar every year. So uh, we grade them out every three weeks. I barrel taste, uh, which sounds onerous, but it's probably the funnest thing that I get to do. And I take really copious amount of notes on every single barrel in the cellar. Um, and then only in the fall, when we get towards blending and bottling, do we actually select and put those wines together. So it's a big jigsaw puzzle, uh, but we're looking for wines with great expression, um, really polished aromatics and, and, and sort of uh, a lot of vibrancy in the reserve Pinot. So, so Jesse, we are, um, just a couple of questions that came through. First of all, someone said, which Pinot Noir are we on? We are on the Pinot Noir Reserve. So the, the uh, first Pinot Noir is the 2017 Reserve. So that's the, the, the Pinot Noir that we're drinking now. Um, someone asked, is, is all the fruit from your 45 acre estate? And then we had another shout out for the screw caps. Love the <laughs> screw caps. Yeah, um, no, the, the reserve is a blend. It, it's our shape, like 40, 50%. I have to look back at my notes, but somewhere in that, that range uh, comes from our estate property here in the Dundee Hills. A fair slug of, of the, the barrels selected are from uh, Freedom Hill. Um, so it's south of here, about 30 miles. We'll get to that wine in a bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the, you know, the majority of this is from our top vineyards, of course, our Blue Ribbon kind of Grand Cru sites. Um, but the other vineyards are no slouch either. They just help round out some of those components. And I think add extra layers to the wine. So um, I think it's a really approachable Pinot Noir too, that upon release, um, I think it showcases really well. And it's really kind of pleasing. It kind of casts a broad net. Uh, in terms of the stelv and screw caps, um, like the viticulture, we could talk about another whole seminar on what the winemakers call closures. Um, when I studied wine, uh, went to school at Lincoln University in New Zealand to study enology and viticulture in 1999. And uh, you guys know probably Kiwis and Aussies were kind of at the vanguard for, for making alternative closures like uh, screw caps really popular, um, have done a great job of that. For me, I grew up um, with cork finished wines, a little bit of a few of our wines are cork finished still, but I really like screw caps too. Um, they've made it their way up our, uh, our product line every year. And these are also um, Stelvin Plus screw caps. So these are like the Kleenex brand. These are the people that kind of put screw caps on the, on the, on the mark. Um, and these are just, they're, they're the, one of the best closures you can buy. I, I love their consistency. There's no TCA. The permeability is the same for every bottle. So the first bottle of wine that I bottle and the last are exactly the same in terms of their permeability. You don't have any variation bottle to bottle. You can store them in any orientation, which is great. So you can store them upside down, right side up, doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to keep any cork wet. And that sort of confidence that the winemaker has for their wines for me is really important. I mean, you know, we, I think sometimes some folks I think get a little caught up in if it's cork finish and it's not something I subscribe to because we spend like a year growing the grapes and a year making the wine. So every bottle of wine that you have from our property is pretty much two years of work. And the last thing a winemaker does to it is, uh, is put a closure on it. It's quite literally the last thing. So for us, um, although the, the, the best part about 
um, alternative closures like screw caps is they literally force the cork industry to make better products, which is awesome. So now, 20 years later, 30 years later, your corks are better because they were forced to get better. Um, so our corks now, these puppies are uh, 55 mils, uh, so they're super long. The grade of corks, these corks are like a dollar a piece. So they're 12 bucks a case, very expensive, but the grade can't be higher. And they're all tested for TCA. So they're way more, um, um, I don't know, dependable than they used to be. Um, so that's great, but it took kind of screw caps and alternative closures to push the cork industry that way. But I'm really happy to have both. So should we move on to the next Pinot? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we're going to pour the, uh, the estate Pinot Noir and then the Freedom Hill. Um, and so these are two of our single vineyard property wines. So give you guys a sense. Um, these are the two property wines that we've been making as single vineyard wines for the last 30 years. We literally have 30 years of experience. Um, I don't know if you, if and when, and this is an open invitation, you guys come to the winery because you're more than welcome. Uh, virtual is great, but having you here would be even better. Uh, we could go back and taste some of these older wines, which is an incredible experience to see how these wines age over time. These two sites are for us, I mentioned kind of our, our Grand Cru vineyards, our blue ribbon sites. Um, I really think if there is a, a crew system in the United States, these sites would definitely be Grand Cru. They're both east facing, they're both high elevation. They're very different soil types, but in terms of their, um, their overall quality, they're just incredible. And to give you guys a sense, both of the bottlings that you have, to juxtapose them a little bit, they're both 25-ish barrels of selection, which is the top 10% of each of the vineyards that we, that we make wine from. It's the top 10% of each, Freedom Hill and Estate. Both the same vintage, so it's a horizontal. They're both 2016, um, but I think they're very different wines. I mentioned the soil types earlier. We talked a little bit about the volcanic soil types here in the Dundee Hills for our estate, but Freedom Hill is on 100% marine sedimentary soils. They're almost 60 million year old soils. They're uplifted ancient seabeds, and uh, it's a subtype called bell pine. Um, the way we farm it's a lot different than it, the jewelry soils we have here and very different wines in terms of their profile. And if you're chasing terroir, if that's something you like to do as a winemaker or a wine drinker, um, a wine appreciator, that's, uh, that's for us is what kind of gets us up in the morning to see those, the differences between the two. 100% Pinot Noir, 100% uh, varietally and expressive from their sites, but I think very different wines. Um, the estate Pinot Noir, from the Dundee Hills tends to exhibit a little bit more red fruit and kind of blue fruit. I think it has a lot of beautiful, my father would call uh, Indian spices. So cardamom, clove, um, maybe even a little bit of nutmeg. There's some really interesting spices happening and tends to have that great minerality, kind of that core acid that kind of rides through the wine, clear to the finish. So it kind of has a beautiful trolley that kind of carries that acid in that frame all the way through. It doesn't have the structure of Freedom Hill. So if you look at the Freedom Hill Pinot Noir, it's a little bit different in that that wine almost always plays in a black to blue fruit spectrum. Almost always. I don't see a lot of red fruit outside of my block of, of uh, 115 clone there. It's almost always black, black and blue fruit. So big structure, tends to be very Cote de Nuit. So big shoulders on the wine. Um, sometimes uh, for some of my, my friends and buddies and colleagues and customers that are like, you know, Pinot Noir is a little too light for me. I drink a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon. You're like, this is a great gateway Pinot for them because it's got great structure. It's got tannin loads that almost have to be restrained when I, when I farm it, when we pick it. It almost has to be kind of like pulled back a little bit and kind of coax out some of the more ephemeral notes in Freedom Hill because it brings tons of power to the, to the table. So um, hopefully you guys see some differences between the two. Um, 2016 was an interesting vintage because it was, uh, it was extremely early. We had really early bud break. We had really early bloom and flowering. Uh, we had a warm summer. So the wines tend to have, uh, and we had very early picking. We picked this vineyard here behind me on September 1st. Um, so anything you want to say about the vintage here in Oregon for 2016 can be predicated by that term early. It was pretty fast. I think we picked all of our fruit 
all the whites and reds within 10 days. So it's very compact. Um, and I'm really thankful that I got such a dedicated team that works with me to make that happen. Um, so we retained a lot of acid in the wine, so a lot of that freshness, but they showcase that power of the vintage where they're pretty, they're pretty big, they're pretty voluptuous, um, they're pretty dense wines. I'm gonna have a sip. <laughs> Please do. So Jesse, a um, couple questions that have come through. Uh, is Lane considering planting any other varietals that might thrive in, in warmer weather? It seems, seems to be moving north from California to Oregon. And then in terms of oak, French oak, American oak, or both? <laughs> Yeah, the climate change question. Yeah, the climate change question is, uh, I think, uh, important and definitely a topical one. Um, the Northwest tends to be, from all the data I've looked at, um, a lot, all the data I've read, all the articles I've read, suggests that the Northwest, because of our proximity to the, the Pacific Ocean right here in the coast, it's fairly protected from the, um, uh, not impervious to, but protected from the vagarities and the are varies in the uh, sort of warming of the climate. So we haven't seen um, a tremendous amount of difference there. Uh, I think things are riper maybe, you know, maybe a week earlier, but some of that can be uh, attributed to our viticultural techniques. You know, I mentioned in the 70s and the 80s and, you know, maybe early 90s, our viticulture wasn't exactly top-notch or world-class. And I think you've seen a lot of those uh, improvements happening too, which maybe lead towards a little bit earlier ripening vines and grapes anyway. I mean, in the early 80s, we never used to drop fruit. And now I drop a lot of fruit on the ground. We literally pay people and my team to come through and, and drop fruit on the ground because we're trying to get the best, best expression of a block. So um, that is something in terms of varietals that we, we could look to plant here. I know we have some friends planting uh, Tempranillo here in the Willamette Valley, um, which I think really thrives in the Umpqua Valley, uh, but we haven't planted anything that's, uh, that would be considered new yet. I mean, I think sometimes you want to balance that uh, uh, sort of experimental hat with your responsible GM hat. You're like, it'd be really fun to plant this here, but um, at the other level, you're like, maybe Pinot Noir would be better at this 650 foot Dundee Hills east facing slope. You know, why would you take that chance? So um, we're not in, uh, against trialing, but we have nothing new uh, to date. And then uh, French oak. Uh, so in terms of the, the oak regime here, um, you know, oak comes in so many different facets you can have you know, specific forests in France. I actually, I order French oak from specific forests, from specific coopers with specific toast levels, aged before um, fabrication for specific locks of fruit, if you can imagine that. Uh, so it gets really detail oriented. Um, for us, our approach to French oak is, uh, and, and outside of the little tempranillo that we make, we pretty much employ 100% French oak. All of our barrels um, at the clip of like 99% are all, three-year air dried. So they're dried as staves uh, for an additional year. The industry standard's 24. So they're, they're more expensive, but we like the way that that works with Pinot Noir. I think it has a more deft touch, a little softer um, sort of frame for the wine. And we look for Pinot Noir. I mean, really at the end of the day, we want to make wines that are varietally co correct and then regionally correct. So the wines, they are what they say that they are at the very least, especially for Pinot Noir when you're chasing expression. And you can definitely use French oak to sort of overtake a wine, um, but we kind of want to use oak as a way to sort of help frame a wine, maybe fill in any holes, make a more complete wine, but never to dominate the wine. That's not something we look to do. So it's interesting that, that uh, this question came up. I mentioned earlier that 2016 was pretty bold, uh, pretty warm, pretty early. Um, we actually uh, racked uh, our 100% new French oak barrels, both of these 2016 wines are probably in the 40% range. We racked them out of new French oak in March, March or early April, into two or three year old French oak because these wines were big enough, they were kind of bold enough, they were sort of gregarious enough, they didn't require a lot of new French oak. And I didn't feel, it's sort of a, a different approach than we had in 2015, 2017, in, an, in a, you know, a different year. We just felt like the wines, they would get masked by having too much of that influence. Um, so we actually racked in, in April or, or March, 
um, out of new French oak into older wood. And it's weird because we spend $100,000 on French oak every year. And I walked in my cellar in you know, July and June and all the barrels are upside down, all the new barrels. So you think about that sort of capital outlay um, and that approach, but that's a decision we made because we felt the wines would benefit better by not being in 100% new French oak for that long. A great, great question for these two specific wines. And I think they, I think they have enough density. They, they just didn't, they didn't require it. So, um, Jesse, thank you for leading to those five wines. Um, I've had enough wine that I think I'm going to go rogue and unmute everyone. Um, so behave everybody, but that way if someone's got some questions they'd like to ask or I'm interested in some reactions on um, some of the wines, I think all five of them have just been lovely this evening uh, and really have enjoyed tasting them. But I do want to give folks a chance to, to ask some questions. I know there was one question that came up way back on the whites about mallow treatment and leaves treatment, but I'm going to unmute everybody because I am, I know we got a, a comment about how well the Pinot Noir, the Freedom Hill is going with steak. So that's really fun to hear. Um, but then that way we can get some, share some um, reactions and some thoughts as well as some questions folks might have. But I do know that a question came through uh, on the whites about mallow treatment and leaves treatment as well. So the approach is, is really specific. Um, for us, especially for Pinot Green Chardonnay, um, there sort of is a, uh, every year is different and every block is different. So every varietal, every vessel is different, but there sort of is this like uh, sort of um, critical mass when you get with mallow where you're sort of monitoring it and you lose vibrancy. You might gain some structure um, and some texture on wines, but you lose like pop in the wines or like energy is sort of a great way to describe it. You lose energy. so. Sometimes in different vintages, I'll encourage ML a little bit, but we literally monitor it on a case by case basis. I don't have an idea in my head like, you know, this bottling is going to be 25% mallow converted. I have a range of what I'm looking for, but for us, it's not something we employ anywhere near 100% every year. Uh, maybe 50% tops for, for Pinot Gris and Chardonnay, but um, it's something we monitor on a case by case basis because for me, like when I lose that vibrancy in the wine, it sort of becomes really boring and flabby. And for me, it doesn't interest, especially in a young wine, because you know they're going to round out over time. You know, those acids, I think of them sort of as like a Richter scale, right? So all those acids can be kind of pointy and sharp, you know, um, especially when they're young. But over time, in a little bit of bottle age, little time in cellar, they tend to round out. They become more curved and rounded. And I think you see that in how wines develop in your cellar and how little wines develop, um, you know, over time. So okay. the question is, yeah, does anyone in Willamette grow on west-facing slopes? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's one of those sort of uh, peculiarities of growing grapes. Uh, west-facing slopes are, you know, you get the western sun. So once the sun comes up over Mount Hood, over the Cascades, that's in the west behind me. Um, you know, it gets warmer. So once you get those really hot days, because Lama Valley is, it's warm in the summertime, like July to August, it gets hot. I mean, we're, you know, maybe not consistently as hot as the front range, but certainly, um, you know, it's not uncommon to see plenty of days over 90, 95. So uh, that, that west facing slopes can be really good, but they think you need to monitor them separately in terms of your leaf removal. Um, so I typically, uh, for our west facing slopes, we have a couple sites I work with where we'll leave a lot more shading in the canopy um, uh, to prevent a sort of afternoon sun from sunburn, because that can be a factor. So there are a lot of sites that are west facing, even north, because, you know, for a consumer, you guys hear a thing like, you know, Dundee Hills, Appalachian, or Napa Valley, or, you know, you're like, great, but St. Helena, you know, but that makes sense. But I think really everybody's making pretty good wine, you know, across the board. Everybody's, you know, growing pretty good grapes. But I think the devil is in the details um, for what you're chasing for singular expression. Um, and West Facing Soaps definitely have a different, um, different expression than stuff that, that has the morning sunlight, for sure. So... 
Mm -hmm. we, we just got a question about the barrel toasting on the Freedom Hill. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so I mentioned that we literally, uh, I was talking about selecting certain um, uh, forests in France, like Trance or Allier or Bertrange um, for, for certain blocks of Pinot Noir. For Freedom Hill, um, it probably sees more new French oak than any other vineyard that we work with on a year to year basis. So consistently that's, that's accurate. Um, Freedom Hill, I usually use a, a fair bit of uh, Bion. So it's a specific Cooper. Um, almost all of it's uh, from the Vosges forest in France. So specific forest of French oak. 100% three year air dried um, and a fair bit is uh, a medium long toast. So it's sort of a little bit of a lower temperature, but a longer duration on the toast level, toasted heads as well. So all the staves are toasted and the heads of the barrel. Um, it's Freedom Hill for me, because of the nature of the fruit and the profile, it can handle and it almost asks for a little bit more of that structural uh, French oak to sort of help balance it. Um, and sort of create more of a, a richer, um, more textured profile on the palate. So um, we do select a lot of, of specific barrels for blocks and, and that's one of my favorite coopers for, uh, um, uh, for the Freedom Hill bottling. And one thing I'd like to say too, like it, it sort of bears mentioning, like I work in, with a whole team in my cellar that's incredible. My assistant winemaker, Dan Papa has been with me over a decade. Um, I'd like to say I taught him everything I know, but that's not true. Uh, he's incredibly gifted. He's really smart. And he's got a real, um, I think, a, a singular gift for matching barrels with wine. Um, and he's really helped dialed in some of those things. And especially in the last three or four years, we've gone from strength to strength. And um, it's really, it, it's awesome to, to have that sort of capacity in myself. Uh, muted. Okay. So Jesse, can you speak to your labels? What's up with the fish lures? Yeah, so we're big fly fisher people here. Uh, we, we love fresh water. Um, we we uh, are big, you know, obviously our salmon safe certified vineyards and et cetera, but the flies on the label are something I always gloss over because, well, I've been looking at them for 25 years. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I used to be a, a guide a little bit on the Deschutes River um, here and there, and uh, the flies are all handcrafted. So they're all hand tied. These are all photographs. We, we think it's sort of an emblem of the Northwest and our philosophy for our land and fresh water. So their uh, expressions and hopefully as complex and, you know, and, and evocative as the wines they adorn. So we have a different fly, uh, professional fly tires that tie these for us. They're all photographs and um, they're all like $800 a piece. So they're pretty expensive. I don't fish with them because I get too many in trees, right? So, uh, but it's, it's just sort of, a, I don't know, it, it's what we do, it's who we are, and we think it's specific to, uh, to our region. About the um, Oregon, the Freedom Hill being bigger than, than others, that it is definitely bigger. Um, we did get a comment about the, someone loves fly fishing, so they think the labels are really cool, so that's great. And then I am gonna unmute, if I can do this here, one of the participants that wants to make a comment directly, and I know this is someone that has been to your winery. So again, let me see if I can do this. Uh, there we go. Okay. Hey, Mark, it worked. Uh, yay. Jesse, Jesse, thanks for all of this. I, Jan and I got a chance to visit your winery about two years ago. And um, I know we've been talking a lot about the Pinot Noirs, but as soon as Mary told me that she was doing this event with you, um, the first thing out of my mouth was, I think that place had the best Pinot Gris I've ever had in my life. Oh. And so uh, I, I really agree with you on the complexity. I didn't realize you guys were doing as much blending as you're doing. You know, I can just envision you with the 40 different <laughs> barrels of different things and then using the blending process to bring out the complexity was fantastic. So I, I just appreciated it. And for those of you on the, on the, uh, the call who haven't been there, their new tasting room is beautiful. It's got a gorgeous view of, of Dundee and um, it's a little hard to drive to where you guys are, but it's worth the little trip. And um, we were lucky enough to run into your dad actually in the parking lot on the way out. <laughs> he was great too. So thanks for being here. It's, this is, this is terrific.
Thank you. It's uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I mean, it's it is quite literally an invitation to you guys. So, uh, any chance that you know when all this this uh, C nineteen or, ordeal lifts a little bit, this cloud, you guys are all welcome. It's a personal invitation, and uh, my email address is just jesse at langwinery dot com, jesse at langwinery dot com, and um, you guys send me an email anytime, and I'm happy to respond and happy to uh, you know really actually just share a glass with you when you come out. I, I, I can't wait to open, to be open for business, uh, to be open in our taste room and just uh, be able to walk around our property and see people enjoying themselves. I think is really, will be re really exciting and heartening. And uh, my team is like chomping at the bit and mm -hmm. uh, our whole winery is. So it's going to be, it's going to be fun. And we're going to get through this together. And um, it just, I think like the, the capacity of wine to bring people together like this is just, um, I want to say it brings me to tears, but it definitely it's emotional and it's just super cool. So I really appreciate you guys um, taking the time to to meet with us and for Bruce and Mary to put this together. It's just been um, really just um, you know it's an honor. Well, and Jesse, thank you for mentioning the team because that's really the last thing I was going to share with you is um, the other very strong memory we have of our visit there was the the tasting room rep um, when she realized that a couple of us were in the industry brought us outside your tasting room where you have those little uh, short rows of different clones side by side. And we were there two weeks before harvest and she let us um, observe the different clones from one row to the next and even cook, pick a little bit of the fruit and see how it tasted and how the, the uh, you could even get the, the sense of the, uh, the tannins right out of the skins from the 667 versus the 777 versus the Dijon, the Pomard. And that was really impactful for us and, and something we'll never forget. And we really appreciate the extra time. Your team was, your team was great. Well, that's great too. I will, I will pass that along happily. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it's one of those things where you get to be, um, you know, it's, a, it's an epiphanous label for me. It's my last name. Yeah. So every bottle of wine that we, we craft and every wine that we release has to be good enough for my family to be good enough for you guys. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, we never looked at a bottle of wine or a barrel of wine and said, oh, we can make more money by putting that here. <laughs> We, 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 we make all those decisions predicated on how good the wine, how do you make the best wine? And, and all of that is informed by how good your team is. You know, my, my vineyard team, our cellar team, our hospitality team, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, you know, combination of all those components um, mm -hmm. is how you build a brand. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be a cheerleader for that. I, I, I play a part, but um, as you guys know, I'm sure you guys, you, you're, no, you're no better than the people behind you. And, um, and with you, shoulder to shoulder. And that, that's how we feel, too. Across the globe and uh, bringing people together. So it's, it's really, like I said, an honor. So thank you. Yeah. That's what it's all about, right? What it's all about, definitely. Right. All, right, all right, guys. Well, thank you. Cheers. Have a good evening. Enjoy some Cheers. food. Thanks, everyone. Take care.